<laughs> All right, so the, the recording's on. So today is our last class lecture before the third test is going to be available to you through Blackboard. I will be making the test today and tomorrow and posting it on Blackboard. It will be due um, next Monday or Wednesday. I think I said Wednesday for y'all. Um, anyway, so you'll have a little bit more than a week to work on it. It's 100 points, and it's going to cover everything that we've talked about social stratification up until this point. Um, I've got, today is when I need your 50-point um, your assignments if you haven't already turned them into me. And I posted, was it on Saturday? I can't remember when I posted an announcement for you all on Blackboard about the end of the semester schedule. So we've got, yeah, so, so it's on Blackboard. If you didn't see it in your email inbox, I sent it to your email inbox also. But if you didn't see it there, please go into Blackboard and look at the most recent announcements because we are getting really close to the end of the semester. Um, we've got three weeks of class between now and Thanksgiving break, and then we have Thanksgiving break, and we come back for we only see each other just one day after that, and then we have our last exam. So the schedule for when all the rest of our points are going to be due, that schedule is um, on Blackboard also, I think in the same announcement. I think I put it all in the same announcement. It's called something like end of the semester schedule or something like that. And so make sure that you're familiar with that. Um, and because we are reaching the end of the semester, I have been as flexible as possible with y'all turning in your uh, assignments kind of around the due date for some of you instead of exactly on the due date. And I can, I can be less and less flexible. Let me reword that so it makes more sense. I can't be as flexible with due dates moving forward because there ain't no more time to move forward. Okay, so I mean, it's like, you know, there's just not any more time. So um, if you still owe me uh, work from some other assignment, turn it in now. You cannot earn full credit for something that you turn in now from some former, um, from some former assignment, but get, get on the ball, I guess, if you're, if you're lagging a little bit with these due dates because I can't be flexible moving forward because there's just not any time. Any questions or anything? How many more grades again do we have? Yeah, so um, there's the 50 point thing that's, that's not graded yet, obviously, that'll be um, in Blackboard soon. The grades will. Um, 100 points next week, that, that third test. That's the online thing? Uh huh, it'll be online. It'll probably be in two parts because there's going to be some written component to it and then also multiple choice, and so I'm probably going to put it in like two parts. But the total grade is going to be 100 points. Um, and then. Uh, we will have one more 25-point activity that you do part at home and then part as a group. Um, and that will be before Thanksgiving break, which is in three weeks. And then over Thanksgiving break, you will have that fifth optional 25-point activity. If you need to know why I say optional, read that announcement in Blackboard that I have posted because I explain it in there. And then um, as soon as Thanksgiving break is over, you will have a fourth test, final exam test that will be due when our final exam is scheduled to be due, which I think is Monday the, I want to say that's Monday the 9th, I want to say, of December, I think is our final exam slot for this particular class, Friday, the Friday before for online classes and like the Tuesday after or something for my Tuesday, Thursday classes. So all those dates and the point values for these things are posted in, in Blackboard, okay? Any other questions? Okay, so today, like I said, is our last day of um, notes before the third test. So even though we are going to have class on Wednesday, and even though we are going to have class, on, and I'm going to post the video for that online, and even though we're going to have class next Monday before this test is technically going to be due in Blackboard, those two classes we're going to have Wednesday and Monday of next week are going to be for the fourth test material. Okay? So your third test is going to be due after we begin the fourth test material. Today's class is the cutoff for test three. Uh, no, whatever we learn today absolutely will be revisited for the fourth test, but whatever we learn on Wednesday and, and um, Monday of next week won't be 
uh, do won't be tested until the fourth test. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So, any other questions about schedule or the end of the semester kind of housekeeping stuff? We're good. Okay, so um, this is a continuation of what we talked about on Wednesday of last week where we talked about race and ethnicity and the difference between those two concepts and then sex and gender and the difference between those two concepts, okay? So today's class, we, and we also had the words dominant group, dominant groups versus subordinate groups on the board. We had them on the board, but we didn't define them. Is that right? We haven't defined them yet. Dominant groups versus subordinate groups. Right, we did those. Did we define dominant groups or subordinate groups? No, okay. So that's where we're going to start today um, with talking about this. And we're going to talk about the difference between prejudice and discrimination. If I can spell it, we will. Prejudice versus discrimination. And then also the difference between micro level discrimination and macro level discrimination. Um, on the, we call it institutional discrimination. So we've got something called personal discrimination. Personal, of course, is going to be the macro. Excuse me. No, it's not. Micro, thank you. Y'all are correcting me. Yeah, personal is the micro scale, one on one behaviors that people engage in. And on the macro scale, we call it institutional discrimination. Okay, institutional discrimination. This is the macro scale stuff. And we have a vocabulary word called social institutions. Remember that vocabulary word from, shoot, what, what chapter? I think chapter one. I think we started talking about social institutions way back in August. Okay? So this word institutional discrimination, which is the macro scale kind of discrimination, this word refers to social institutions like the family in air quotes with a capital F, or the government, or the education system, or religion, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, the economy, right? All of the social institutions that exist on the macro scale and have kind of control over our lives give us a framework for how we're supposed to behave on a daily basis. It's where our norms come from, where our social facts come from, the social institutions we've been studying this semester. Okay? So these are our last few topics about social stratification. Okay. So a dominant group. Well, let me, actually, let me wait. I see people still, still writing. Just make sure you save some space between these things in your notes um, like I've done on the board. So we can talk about them and connect, connect some dots between them. I turned in the writing part of that assignment on Blackboard, was that okay? I turned in the writing part of that assignment on Blackboard, was that okay? Okay, okay. but not this part? Not this part. Okay, that's right. Did you, yeah, okay, I'll find it. Okay, no problem. Okay, still see a lot of writing going on. Okay, so a dominant group um, versus a subordinate group. These two words are used regularly throughout your reading assignment from chapters 9 and 10. Remember, chapter 9 is about race and ethnicity and the social inequality that is wrapped up in race and ethnicity definitions. And chapter 10 is about sex and gender and sexuality and body type and all of those kinds of ascribed statuses that also work into social inequality, okay? So chapter 7 and 8 is about how achieved statuses can affect our position within the social inequality system, social stratification system, and chapter 9 and 10 are about ascribed statuses. Okay, 
So dominant versus subordinate groups. You are probably more familiar with these terms, majority versus minority groups. Am I right to assume that you're more familiar with maybe these words, majority versus minority? Okay. Let me say that we all, myself included, need to correct our vocabulary a bit because majority, what, does, what do these two words imply? It implies numbers. Yes, that's exactly what was on my mind. So majority versus minority implies numbers. And that's not necessarily the case. There is, we know the phrase, what, there's strength in numbers? You know that phrase? So yes, there is strength in, you know, the more people you have behind you, the more power you can exert, right? But the dominant group is not always the most numerous group in society. The dominant group is simply the most powerful group in society. A dominant group has power. A dominant group has control over social resources or material resources, like raw materials that can, can be used to um, make money, for instance. So a dominant group is not about numbers always, but it is always about power. It is always about control. Okay? You okay? Okay. So dominant is really the proper word that we should use when we're talking about um, power differences among the different groups that we have in a very diverse society, like the society that we have in the United States. Some cultures don't have as much racial or ethnic diversity as in the United States. Some cultures simply have uh, diversity among the sexes or the gender definitions, the behaviors associated with your gender, and there emerges in those kinds of societies a dominant group based on your sex or your gender category. And in a, in a diverse culture like the United States, we have dominant groups that are not just based on race and ethnicity, but also based on sex and gender too. So it gets really complicated with um, a very diverse culture like we have here, a diverse society like we have here in the United States. The dominant group is not always the majority. It always is the powerful group. Subordinate group. A subordinate group is inferior by definition. A subordinate group is subject to the will and the power of the dominant group. Okay? They are inferior by definition, not by birth, not by some kind of physical trait like we talked about um, in, uh, in class on Wednesday. Societies have different definitions for race or different definitions of, um, of ethnicity. Subordinate groups are inferior to the dominant group because they are the powerful ones. And subordinate groups can be different based on race, based on ethnicity, based on sex, based on gender, based on religion, based on etc., etc., etc. Whatever those things are that we discussed last week and, and described as the differences between people in society, like race, ethnicity, sex, gender. If your race matches the dominant group, you have more power in society. If your sex category matches the dominant group, then you have more power in society. If your gender behaviors match the dominant group, then you have more power in society. If your ethnicity, such as your customs, your tradition, your language, your religion, match that of the dominant group, well, you're not the subordinate group at all. You're in the dominant group. Let me use some space on the board here 
I'll put these words back in a second, to continue talking about the dominant group in the U.S. Oops, I did not mean to scratch out the word powerful. <laughs> I just was getting a, little, getting a little happy when I was underlining it there. Okay, so in the USA, there is a, an acronym. Y'all know what acronym means? Yes. Yeah, so you take the first letters of several words and make a, a word for them. There's an acronym that some of you maybe have already heard of and you definitely will hear about it in political science class or, or history class. But in the U.S., WASPs are the powerful group. It looks so familiar. Good, I'm glad it looks familiar. Maybe, maybe that familiarity and then our discussion about this today is going to help you remember what it is from now on. Anybody know what it mean, what it stands for? Anglo-Saxon, excellent, Coco, yes. Okay, white Anglo-Saxon, what's the P? White Anglo-Saxon Protestants. White Anglo-Saxon Protestants, that's what WASP stands for. What are Anglo-Saxons, y'all know? Well, yeah, I mean, we know it's white people. We've got the white there, but specifically from England, yes, specifically English uh, descent, people with English heritage are Anglo-Saxons. That has a particular brand of Protestantism, a particular type of Protestantism. Protestantism is a religion, yes. Pro Protestant, that word is, is about protest. It's protest of the Catholic Church. Because originally the only Christian church yeah, was, was Catholic Church, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and there have been several different protests against the Catholic Church in 1600 years before, um, before one of them, you know, really took off. Luther, for instance, or John yeah, Calvin. That's right. I should have gone yeah. to Israel. They were saying you're a Christian there, and that all the people that were today, people was, it was Catholic. And yeah, today Christian means Protestant and Catholic. But 500 years ago, Christian only meant Catholic. Yeah, a little bit more than 500 years ago, right? Okay, so white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, like Henry VIII became a Protestant, and his daughter Elizabeth I was the head of the Church of England, a Protestant faith that took off. And it was in, um, or that survived, I guess. Um, it was in... Um, it was about being Protestant. It was about religious freedom that the pilgrims first came to the United States anyway. And that's a topic that we're actually going to discuss in depth in our next unit that we're going to start um, Wednesday or, or Monday of next week. We will talk about how religion specifically affects social structure on the macro scale. Victoria, are you with me? Put it away. Okay. So anyway, yes, in the USA, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are the dominant group, historically have been, okay? Let's, so this is a racial category that we define based on physical characteristics like the color of your skin, right? Anglo-Saxon is a cultural characteristic or an ethnicity, and the Protestant faith is one of the markers of that ethnicity, okay? Anglo-Saxons are not... Irish people, they're not French people, they're not Spanish people, they are not Norwegian people, they are English people who have the Protestant faith. Not Catholic English people, Protestant English people. That's who kind of set up the heritage that we call American history these days. Okay? However, when I say white Anglo-Saxon Protestants and we're talking about the dominant group, can we put a sex or a gender category with that to say who is like the most dominant of all the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants? Males? What makes you say that? Life experience? <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. So this is about race and ethnicity, but we can add to this a sex and gender component because here is a word for you. Patriarchy. Who's heard this word before? Many people have heard wasp before, maybe didn't know what it was. Many people have heard patriarchy before, maybe didn't know what it was. Who knows? Who can tell me? 
Yes, there we go. I like the way you put it. The dudes are over everything. Yes. <laughs> so um, patra comes from a Latin word um, pater, which means father. In this case, we're, to, we're going to say male. And you know what? Anytime we've talked about this before, a hierarchy um, is something that it has, has a, ranking, a ranking in it. So this is male dominated, male on the top, male most powerful, male dominant society. This is the most common social organization. This is a macro scale social organization. This is the most common macro scale social organization in the entire world, okay? So this is not unique to USA culture. This is unique to USA culture. But this is not unique to USA culture. We simply inherit this from way longer ago, way farther back in history than any white Anglo-Saxon Protestant set foot, set foot on the soil. Okay? A patriarchy is a male-dominated society. We can go deeper into this and say that also our dominant group in our society is something we call heteronormative. Let me spell it right. Heteronormative. Who do you think that word refers to? Sexuality, sexual orientation, where the heterosexual lifestyle is the assumed norm that people are going to follow. Right? So we can talk, so, so this is a behavior characteristic, right? Your hetero, heteronormativity is the assumed behavior that you are going to engage in. So the more things that you can check off this list, the more things that you can, are you white, are you Anglo-Saxon, are you Protestant, are you male, are you heterosexual, we could keep going on. We could say able-bodied, we can continue to talk about fitting into a gender description. But these, I guess I should make this little arrow more like this, these things all go into, I'm, I'm pointing at the dominant group, not just the words social resources here. You need to take a picture? Yeah, because uh, I made it way too small. Oh, okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay. So this are these things all together are the oh sorry, sorry. are the um, characteristics of the dominant group. This is on the macro scale, okay? There's lots of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heterosexual males who will say, I am not dominant. I don't feel advantaged in society. This world does not work on my behalf. Lots of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant heterosexual males will tell you that. However, our culture, our social structure, the social institutions are designed but over the years by people in power. If these people have been in power, then they consider their own point of view first because that's a human trait to consider ourselves first before others. And so if they are the powerful group, then our society has been designed with the default position that people, have, people who have the most in common with these characteristics have an easier time in life. They just have an easier time in life. Here's a silly example of how our society might be dominated by this mindset. And this is a silly example, but it's a profound example in my opinion. How many people can find band-aids that match their skin tone? Silly example, right? Okay, there we go. See, there is a lot of sociological value in keeping up with the Kardashians. So don't, 
don't be, you know, don't apologize for watching that. But if Kanye gets mad at Kim because the Band-Aid he needs is, is white instead of his skin tone, well, let's just go to Walgreens and see how, how easy is it for us to purchase Band-Aids that Not match to, somebody's skin tone, right? Yeah. yeah. Not to completely throw that off. They do have Band-Aids now. Yeah, now they, yeah, like they, and here's another word, they, that we always use, right? Um, so, yeah, they, the powerful, we do have access to different skin tone band-aids these days, but so society changes over time, and it's been within your lifetime that you even see those on the shelves. Right, but they are this color. They're not pink and blue, and, the, you know, the Batman band-aids are also a recent thing, so if you just think about band-aids or bandages in general being this skin tone, that is an assumption. It wasn't necessarily mean-spirited people who intentionally want you to have peach color band-aids on your skin as, you know, a diabolical plot. But it's just an example of people in general think of ourselves first, and if you are powerful, I used, again, let me say, it's a silly example, the Band-Aid example, but keep that in mind because other extremely important things in life that can determine your ability to have upward social mobility in life, other extremely important things are biased in the same way that Band-Aids are biased. Okay, so it's, um, again, sorry, I'm sorry I keep, you know, harping on Band-Aids. Some of you have, you know, better examples than that. But I wanted to point out a silly example that hopefully the next time you're in Walgreens, just stop by that aisle and look. Stop by that aisle and see if you, what, you know, what color Band-Aids are available. And they're always skin color, but peach is the skin color. You know, so there's, a, there's an example. Okay, so this is the dominant group in our society. You can go to other cultures and find a dominant group that's going to have a different set of social characteristics, a different set of ascribed statuses that makes them the dominant group. Patriarchy is something that you will find very commonly around the world. So usually males are going to be most commonly members of the dominant group in most societies around the world. There are some matriarchal societies, but they are few compared to the um, patriarchal societies that we have. Okay, keep this in mind, especially when we start talking about institutional discrimination toward the end of this discussion today. Questions? Okay. So, we're not going to make a list of characteristics of subordinate groups in the United States because the list is essentially the opposite of this. If you're not white, guess what? There's a mark, there's a marker that you are a member of a subordinate group. If you're not Anglo-Saxon, there's a marker, bless you, that you're not a member of a subordinate group. If you are not Protestant Christian, there's a marker that you are a member of a subordinate group, et cetera, et cetera. So here's the checklist for the dominant group in our society. The more check boxes that you have in common with this list, the easier it is for you to negotiate your daily life because on the macro scale, society is set up with your assumed position in mind. The more things that you say, nope, that's not me, nope, that's not me, nope, that's not, that's not, that's not, then you are in some kind of way inferior in power, inferior in control or access of social resources, inferior in political voice. You have to go the extra mile some kind of way to have access to the same kind of power or social resources that others simply inherit through their ascribed statuses in society. Anybody? Questions? No? Okay. All right, so.
So let me erase this and get back to the two words that were in the middle of the board. And I'll go ahead and erase these and put them back on the board in a minute. Okay, so we need to talk about the difference between prejudice and discrimination. Okay, just the concepts in general. Notice I don't have the word personal or the word institutional as an adjective in front of these right now. Okay, so uh, just like race, ethnicity, just like sex and gender, I notice often that people use these words interchangeably and they aren't interchangeable. Okay, so let's get them straight. Prejudice is an attitude. It's an attitude usually based on stereotypes. I think your book says something like overgeneralizations or something. That's what a stereotype is. Um, prejudice is an attitude based on stereotypes, which are overgeneralizations about a group or an individual. And it's also based on something that we talked about in chapter two, I think, ethnocentrism. Bless you. Ethnocentrism, I think we talked about that in, yeah, back when we first were learning about what culture is back in September. You will notice that this word looks a lot like the same root word here. Now we know that ethnicity is about behaviors. It's about behaviors. Ethnocentrism, you are focused on your own behaviors. You assume your own behaviors are, here's my air quotes, normal, or maybe even, here's some more air quotes, you assume that your behavior is natural to human beings. Because you've learned it in your socialization process, you have learned your ethnicity, since it's about behaviors. None of us are born knowing any of our behaviors. Yes, we have to eat, sleep, pee, and poop, but the behaviors associated with that, we learn the appropriate ways to do that. Um, so ethnocentrism is the idea that your way of life, your way of life, is the normal one. And if you don't do my way of life, well, you're not normal. And that is a false, that's a false idea. Okay, there are many, many ways of doing things, many, many different beliefs, many, many different food ways and, and um, customs and traditions and holidays, etc. ways of dressing, all of those kinds of things. Yes, it's the ethnocentrism is the idea that your way of life, your group's way of life is correct, and other people, if they don't do the same things that your group does, then they are incorrect. And ethnocentrism is, has a positive side because it can make us feel loyalty or um, patriotism or it makes us be... Um, in union with a faith that we have, for instance. So ethnocentrism has a positive side, but the negative side is that if powerful people are ethnocentric and they use their ethnocentrism to dominate others, then you have violated human rights. Right? Okay, so that's where ethnocentrism can be very negative it has positive side, but it's also very negative. And so prejudice is based on ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism is just is like assuming that someone is incorrect or wrong or evil. We can even use that word because they don't match your lifestyle, your belief system, your way of life. Stereotypes are just overgeneralizations about how somebody behaves. Or a or assigning a general a generalized assumption about an entire group's behavior. So like Republican Democrats, they have a lot of ethnocentrism? Any group, yeah. It, it, whether it's a political party or whether it is a faith system, 
Um, for instance, the Crusades that you might be studying about in history class, where you've got um, Christians fighting Muslims, or we call them the Ottoman Turks, I guess, in, you know, in uh, your history classes, or ISIS trying to take over, you know, getting rid of infidels, right? These are, ethnocent these are words that come from ethnocentrism. But there's a positive side to that, right? Because a lot of folks would say, well, wait a minute, patriotism and love of my country and my people and my way of life, that can't do harm. Well, most often it doesn't unless you say, everybody needs to be a democracy and I'm gonna go force you to be a democracy because I have power and I'm gonna make my military do what I think is wrong with you, fix what I think is wrong with you for instance. So on a macro scale, this can be a major issue. And as a matter of fact, I, I erased the word institutional discrimination because we're going to talk about it soon, but, um, but it can be the cause of some of the institutional discrimination that exists throughout the world. Questions? So prejudice is an attitude. The difference between discrimination is the discrimination is an action. You actively seek to exclude someone or a group. So you actively seek to exclude or limit rights and privileges based on some kind of preconceived attitude. We've got two A words. Discrimination is action. Prejudice is attitude. They are linked. They are linked. However, here's the big difference. Prejudice is something you keep in your mind. It, it drives your, your beliefs, your attitudes. Discrimination, you are acting on those assumptions, okay? So, for instance, um, right now there is uh, a big push. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, the Spanish teacher, Ms. Ray Trevino, was talking about it before class on Wednesday, some of the Little Rock School District stuff that's going on in the news right now. Yeah, the potential strike and um, there's signs, you know, political action signs in people's yards as you drive around as you drive around Little Rock, uh, one Little Rock school district, you know, they don't want it to be broken up because that kind of action of being broken up in some people's views, some people are saying, wait a minute, that is going to bring about segregation again in the Little Rock school district if you break it up the way you want to break it up. And so that action could cause discrimination within the school system. Right? Okay. And that action is based mainly on, hey, don't neighborhoods need to have schools? Well, if this neighborhood is impoverished and this neighborhood is middle class or wealthy, then are the resources going to be the same in these two schools? No. And this is where we can take this discussion and bring it into the personal versus the institutional discrimination that was also on the board. Any questions so far? No? Okay, so the, the descriptions I've given you about prejudice are about ethnocentrism as like your cultural traits, but you can also be ethnocentric about the sex categories. So for instance, if males are dominant, then it, there could be a social fact in a society that females shouldn't be paid as much because their work isn't as valuable or that females should not be given positions of ultimate authority because their, you know, their capacity for that authority is not in them like it is in a male. Can you give an example? Like like an example same, of what? Like regarding the same problem, but can you use it as a prejudice and a discrimination against women? Okay, so um, you, you mean with like sex categories instead of with, okay. So, for instance, um, a prejudice could be that a man um, doesn't really have an inclination to hire women 
in his company because I'm not really sure if you're going to behave nicely during your time of the month. I'm not really sure whether I can count on you to be as productive as a male because you've got kids and who has to go and deal with Johnny when the school nurse calls and says he's got a fever, That's right? right? And so there's a, an attitude that, gee, I just don't know if I want to invest in a woman based on this. Now, is that because he's a jerk? Or is that because he's responding to social facts that have been set up on the, on the macro level because males are dominant in this society? And so over millennia, not just the short time that the USA has been a thing in the world, but over millennia, patriarchy puts males as dominant, and therefore there are some assumptions that we make about males being the ones who, here's my air quotes, should be in control because they always have, or they always have because they are the most capable, or something like that. So when I choose, so that man, if that man chooses to hire Ian instead of you because of that assumption, then that is actively seeking to limit your job opportunities on the personal level and go with him because he's a him and I'm not going to maybe lose uh, you know a day of productivity or pleasantness each month because of whatever kind of cycle he's on and if he does have children in the future society says he's not the one who's going to miss the majority of work for it see what I mean so that might be on the personal level that's influenced by the macro scale. You look like you want to say something. Is prejudice through socialization then? So that's where that comes Yes, from. prejudice is through socialization. We learn. We learn to do it. Um, it we're not, we are not born knowing how to do anything according to the customs and attitudes um, of our society. We have to learn all of it. Oh, so that's like created our sociological... Yes, we are... Cre we are a product of our socialization process and our sociological imagination that I think you were about to say. If we develop our sociological imagination, we gain power to see through some of the macro scale forces that are causing somebody to maybe have a life experience that's out of their control. So if I hire Ian over you based on macro scale social facts about the reliability or capability of a female in that position, then that's, you have been, you have suffered from discrimination. You might not know that. You don't know who else applied for that job. You might internalize that on the personal ish, on the personal scale. If you remember back to the sociological imagination, it's macro scale and personal scale connected. So on the personal scale, you might internalize that as, gee, I'm just not good enough. I've got to do something different next time on the personal level. You're not holding your femininity or your female category against you. And you might not even be you might not even see that is being held against you. But that macro scale of social fact is affecting the outcome of your life. And you might take it personally and say, well, I'm just a failure, or I'm not good enough, or I'm not going to try for a position like that again. But when you can step back and say, wait a minute, maybe social structure has shaped my life experience to a certain extent. Anybody else? Yes, the word bias can go with prejudice. It is a bias. Yes, a bias is an attitude. Um, it doesn't always have to be a negative bias, but you have to be careful if you have a positive bias, you have to also stand back from that and say, is my positive bias causing negative things or overlooking things around me because I have a bias toward this? Does it kind of create a flip side of the bias against something else? Yeah. Questions? Okay. So, the examples I just gave you, um, Amanda, for your question, uh, you know, the, the guy hiring another guy over the girl because, or over the female because um, of these stereotypes. All females are mean and nasty at least once a month, there's a stereotype. 
all females are going to be out of work um, because as soon as their kids come, because they're going to want to be, you know, with their kids. And there's another stereotype that can affect our actions on the personal level. Okay, so personal discrimination. This is a true story that just made me sick, but um, it happened, I guess, in maybe five years ago, six years ago. It made the national news a, a, a situation of personal discrimination. I'm not going to get it completely right. I want to say it's somewhere in the mountains of North Carolina. This white lady ordered a refrigerator or some big appliance like that from like Lowe's, Home Depot, something like that. It made national news because whoever delivered it to her, it was two fellows that delivered it to her. One of them was black, one of them was white. And she wouldn't let the black guy in her house because of her prejudice. Do what? The worker. The worker, the delivery guy. You know, it was a huge appliance that needed two people, you know, to take it in. And so two people went. And one of them happened to be an African-American guy. And the other one was a white guy, like she was white. And she has a, a something that she learned in her socialization process, prejudice, that she learned in her socialization process. Stereotypes, prejudice, ethnocentrism, all of those things. She used those attitudes within her to act. Remember, discrimination is an act act on a personal level, and she refused to take delivery of the refrigerator until the company could send two white guys to, to, to deliver it to her. Not, I'm not joking. I know, this is not a joke. Not a joke. It made national news, obviously, because um, that's why I know about it. Is because it made, do what? Yeah, search it, because it's, I want to say it's at least five or six years ago. Yeah, and and like low, you know, lady refuses delivery of refrigerator because of yeah, because a black guy delivered it or something. So yeah, it made news years ago. USA Today or something had a had um, an article about it. So personal discrimination happens all the time based on those prejudices that we learn in our socialization process. If we as individuals act on those prejudices. And we limit, it limits um, rights, limits privileges, limits access, limits any of these things. If we personally limit another individual's rights, privileges, access, then we are guilty of personal discrimination. This is going to be micro, yes. This is a micro level action. But of course, these micro level actions come from uh, macro level forces that guide other people's behaviors. So we go through our socialization process with people around us who have learned their actions and their beliefs and their conditions through the socialization process, and they pass it on to us. They pass it on to us. You can really find a lot of macro level forces in language, for instance, that people use. Uh, there's a phrase uh, that some men will use with females, little lady. Little lady. We don't have a little gentleman. You even giggle when I say that, right? Yeah, because little lady means something different than ladies and gentlemen, right? It means something different. It is an inferior thing. I see a bunch of people on their cell phones. I hope you are looking up the um, unfortunate story I told you instead of anything else. Focus on class at the moment. So yes, personal discrimination is always affected by the macro scale social forces, macro scale social facts, the norms that we learn in our socialization process. However, um, it is a personal action that limits rights, access, privileges, etc. You know, keep on going. Power, it limits um, another individual based on perceived social differences, stereotypes, ethnocentrism, attitude. Discrimination takes it to action. Okay? Personal discrimination, if you ask me, is bad enough. However, the next one, the next kind of discrimination that we're going to talk about is... Um, Scary. It's scary. 
Okay, because I mean, on an individual level, you can take a class like this, for instance, and you can learn about social facts, and you can learn about norms, and we can do a self-examination in our daily behavior to see, are we being this jerk, right, that does this? You know, we can examine ourselves. For instance, um, there is a really famous author, he's, he's doing a speaking uh, circuit right now, his name is Ibrahim Kindi, Ibram, Ibram Kindi, and he just wrote um, a book two, three years ago, called I think it's called Stamped from the Beginning. It's about racist behaviors and racist attitudes. And he will tell, he tells you in the introduction to that book, I had to examine myself to see if I had any personal discrimination. I had to examine myself to see, is my action on a daily basis founded in some kind of racist notion that I learned in my socialization process? Now, I am paraphrasing what he says. I don't think he says socialization process. I don't think he says personal discrimination. I'm using these sociology terms intentionally, but that's what his whole book is about. He's like, look, I noticed that I am biased in my life, even though I don't want people to be biased against me. I better not be biased against anybody else if I expect other people not to be biased against me. So he examined himself and then did a whole bunch of historic research and uh, started with the Pilgrims and came up all the way up to um, Angela Davis in uh, the 1970s uh, and 80s. So anyway, uh, personal discrimination is something that if we are mindful, if we are mindful of our, the way, let me rephrase that, if we are mindful of the way we as individuals fit into the larger social structure, we can do something about our own personal discrimination. And I would suspect I'm not saying anything bad about anybody in this room or anybody who's watching this online, but I myself and all of you, anybody who's listening, I pretty much can guarantee we all have some, we all do some kind of personal discrimination unless we examine ourselves and really work against it. I feel like right. retail could kind of make someone like that some type of prejudice. Re retail can? Or prejudice? Work at Ulta. Okay. And I do a lot of middle age. Okay. And they just have a little attitude. And you kind of make. You can perceive an attitude. Okay, so Ulta, Ulta Beauty has a, the, the general clientele is middle aged white yeah, women. Well, okay. if you work in the mornings or. But I, they just kind of feel like, you know. Are they, do they act bougie with you? I Maybe. I feel like you're under them. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I work at a restaurant and I really? feel like that all the time. Oh, like I'm below them yeah. somehow. Well, I don't, okay. like, I know I'm not below them, but I'm saying, like, they... Pick up these subtle messages, exactly. and yeah, exactly. it's not the words, it's not the words that they say, but it's, it's the pair language, it's the body language, it's the attitude that you can pick up. Exactly. That's what we learn in our socialization process, right? It's we learn way more than just the English language, the Spanish language, Swahili, whatever language you learned in your socialization process. It's so much more than that, isn't it? So yeah, if you have noticed in the, their body language, mm -hmm. the cold shoulder means something, right? Their body language, their word choice, mm -hmm. word choice like little lady can absolutely be an act of personal discrimination. Because I had a, it was a lady and she was talking like, I guess she was talking to like one of her other friends like, yeah, blah, 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 and then she looked at me and then like, she just went cold and just got rude. I was like, mm. It's a lot of saying. Vice versa, and I guess it just depends on your race. Because right. like when, like when I'm at work, um, I mean African American women, mostly mm -hmm. middle aged, they down me so bad they will run me like around the restaurant, mm -hmm. and no one else yeah. like does that. Mm -hmm. I've seen it on both sides. It's not okay. Really so the, these the stories, these stories of personal experiences, you now have some academic framework to explain them. And perhaps that academic framework to explain how all of us have maybe been uh, the victim of personal discrimination in the past because of perceived differences, assumed differences. We have to look at ourselves to see if we do the same thing, because if we don't like it, 
can we examine ourselves like Ibram Kendi did and maybe fix ourselves? And can we also be a little less, what? Or not hurt, but um, yeah, like don't, what I want to say is don't blame the, don't blame middle class white women. Don't blame what kind of, you said African American women, what age, was there an age group? Middle age African American women, okay. So if you get an attitude from middle aged uh, African American women and you feel that it's because of your whiteness, or if you get an attitude from middle age, whiteness and age maybe, so it's like ageism and racism, and if you get the flip side, is it necessarily because they were born jerks or have they learned it in their socialization process and do they need to take Ms. Terrell's class so that they'll maybe be better, right? It's absolutely learned behavior. So I heard somebody, I don't know who, somebody said, so how do we fix prejudice? Well, we don't fix it institutionally overnight. But if we fix this in our own lifetime, and then we are responsible for socialization of individuals in the future, whether it's a niece, nephew, or son, daughter, or whoever, then one by one slowly, can your great can your great grandchildren be sitting in sociology class and we're going to talk about how personal discrimination or institutional discrimination is a, a historic fact instead of a current fact? Maybe not that quickly, but yeah. Okay, so that's one of the main reasons why teachers in the school systems need this knowledge. Politicians and policymakers need this knowledge, right? <laughs> send, them, send them on. Send them on. I'll be happy to happy to enlighten them. Gently. Gentle enlightenment. Okay. So yeah, yeah, I need more subscribers on my YouTube channel. I think I'm up to 89. I'll be famous soon. Um, anyway, so let's talk about kind of the scariest part of this to me, anyways, is this last um, word that I had on the board, institutional discrimination. How much time do I have? What time is it, y'all? 1025. 1025? Yeah. Okay. We're going to talk about this as much as we can, but there might be a cliffhanger um, if we don't, if we run out of time. We have like 15 minutes. So, um, institutional discrimination, remember, this refers to refers to macro scale social institutions. Okay, macro scale social institutions. On Wednesday of this week, the topic that we're going to focus on, we are going to focus only on really deep examination of social institutions between now and the end of the semester for all kinds of ways that social institutions affect us in our daily lives. Our, from our socialization process to learning about social facts in society and how institutional discrimination might be built into the system. Okay? So, institutional discrimination occurs when, well, here we go. Institutional discrimination is, um, it happens when different groups of people different categories, let me make this, uh, let me use the word category um, because it's a macro scale word, right? Categories of people have different outcomes, different life outcomes when they experience the same social events. I reworded this a little bit um, when I wrote it on the board. I didn't say social events in the, in the formal definition here. But institutional discrimination happens when different categories of people, women are a category of people, males are a category of people, different racial groups are categories of people, different ethnic groups are categories of people, right? White, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants, there's a category of people. 
So institutional discrimination happens when different categories of people experience the same social institution. For instance, the family, put it in quotes and have a capital F. For instance, the family, sorry. <laughs> Family is a macro-scale social institution regarding males and females. Do males and females have the same life experience in a family? Okay, I hear several people say no, and what am I going to ask you to tell me why, right? Okay, let's look at the role. Let's go to use Chapter 4 vocabulary and talk about the statuses and roles. Are there different statuses and roles in a family? And I don't just mean Nadia's family or Krista's family. I mean family in general. Like the definition of family on a macro scale. Are there different statuses and roles that people are supposed to fill? And who has the dominant role? Who has a subordinate role? Who has the most power? Who is inferior? Males and females have different assumed roles that we learn right now some kindergarten class is reading the golden book and it's talking about daddy coming home from work and mama having supper ready. Okay? So the in our social facts, in the organization of the family, and here's some more air quotes. I'm doing air quotes a lot today. But what's the typical American family look like? Somebody tell me. Mom, mom dad, and... I, I don't know how, and kids, yeah, two point something kids. I think it's like three point something kids now. <laughs> so yeah, m uh, the typical American family now is more than the two kids. But when we say family, the person who wrote that children's book that's being read to some kindergarten class right now has a mommy and a daddy in it probably, and a baby and a sister in it or something, right? We make assumptions about the family, even the definition of the official poverty line. A family of four? The official poverty line, the amount of money needed for a family of four to be at a subsistence level in society. Who's the family of four? Mommy, daddy, sister, brother? That's the assumed format. And because that is the assumed format, another social institution, the economy, the economy sets wages, it sets exchange rates, it sets the value of people's work in society. The economy is organized so that if it's a two-income family, two-income family, you're above poverty. If you're a one-income family, you are probably in poverty. Right? We're organized to be in poverty. Then. Yeah. Maybe the social design creates a situation where people can't help but inherit poverty and stay there. In the same way that people inherit wealth and probably stay there in a society, right? Institutional discrimination. Um, what does this mean? Science, technology, engineering, mathematics. STEM fields. Studies show for decades. The education system, which is another social institution. The education system. K through 12 specifically is what I'm talking about here. Studies show for decades the education system has had an institutional bias toward pushing males into STEM fields and pushing females toward liberal arts or social science or a non-STEM field. And this is data evidence. You can look it up. Historically, STEM fields have been occupied by males in society. And non-STEM fields have been occupied by females in society. Anybody know the basic difference between wages? I'm pointing to economy now. Wages for STEM fields versus wages for a social worker, for instance, which is not a STEM field. It's a big wage gap. So if education has pushed men toward STEM fields 
and directed females away from STEM fields, has the education system contributed to different outcomes for different categories of people as they pass through that? Yeah. That, yes. Yes, absolutely. And now we see a huge push for women in STEM. We have conferences at this college every single year where women in STEM, women in STEM fields come to speak to as many people who will show up. We don't limit it to just females, but a lot of females show up to talk about the opportunity, to talk about don't give up, don't feel singled out if you're the only female in a physics class, right? You know, somebody, persist, persist, right? So um, if, if different categories of people have perceivable data shows that different categories of people on the macro scale across the board from Montana to Mississippi and everywhere in between, those same categories of people have the same unequal outcomes, then institutional discrimination by design, the way the system is set up, treats different groups differently. Yeah, STEM. Oh, and see, okay, and let me say, because you just told me naturally, in my mind, I say I don't like it. However, if we were pointed to it from the very get-go, like broccoli, or pizza, or whatever it is that you do or don't like, if we were directed toward it, required to do it, assumed that you were going to eat that green stuff, then it becomes something that is just there. And it is a cultural thing because people from other, other um, societies, like a, a friend of mine who's an exchange student at Arkansas State University in, um, in Jonesboro, she grew up in China. And she said she, she said that females and males are both assumed that you are going to do well in all of your subjects. There aren't math people and non-math people. You're going to do well in everything because the human brain is the human brain and we're going to develop that. But here, how many of you in this room have ever been kind of given the out that, oh, some people just don't like math or, oh, math just isn't for everybody. That's a behavior. Or, oh, math just isn't one of your strengths. Well, that doesn't, maybe then you're not going to go major in math, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to make you get an A in math, Missy, if I'm your mother, right? So, um, yeah, again, we go to the personal level. If a parent ever says to a child, oh, you're just not good in math. It'll be over soon. I'll help you get through it. That parent is simply unaware, perhaps, that around the world in other cultures, when parents don't have that attitude, a child in their socialization process does not grow to say, I'm just not a math person. Right? So the in, on the social fact level, the macro scale, the way that we learn in our socialization process, we pass on to the next person, that we're in control of their socialization process, and we learned all this. We learned it, we can't help it, and it's not because the people who controlled our socialization process early on are just mean, nasty jerks that have an evil plot to keep some people dominant and others subordinate. But this is just, this is just human society, human culture. Yes, ma'am. I told my daughter, and she'll say, oh, I can't do that, I'm not good. I was like, you're not good at it yet. But practice makes perfect, right? Yeah, practice, Not good at it yet. Good. Okay, any questions about these topics? They're kind of deep topics, right? <laughs> it's kind of um, interesting stuff that we need to think outside our own little sphere and think about that macro scale, the sociological imagination that we've been talking about since, since um, August. We have to see the connection between macro scale stuff and the way it shapes our life experiences. We're not 100% in control of our life experiences. So do you uh, agree that like kind of being hard on your kid as far as educational purposes is like for the best? Um, 
being, I, I would have, we would have to have coffee and discuss what being hard on them means. But, um, but no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to just say across the board, be hard on them because of something, um, because we do have individual personalities, right? Like there's a psychology component of this that we're not, that we're not discussing in sociology class. But, um, but yes, I would probably be, lean more toward the strict side than the not strict side. I almost said, um, what's the, what's the, uh, hippie. <laughs> I almost said hippie. Meaning, but I meant, I meant, there's my stereotype of my overgeneralization, right? Okay, so um, y'all look for the announcement on Blackboard about when the test is going to be ready. Um, I'm going to 